Hi, this is Breathe California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. I'm a volunteer and we put on a program each week designed to teach you and let you know about ways to prevent damage to your lungs. That basically is about 75% energy and 25% tobacco use. We're going to be talking to um, San Jose State Energy student Fabian Rico about the kinds of programs in the future of energy that he's seen in his educational experience. See you in 30 seconds. The ni nice thing about Better Breathers Club is we go in and there's other people sitting around with oxygen. It, it, it's almost a, a relief that everybody looks the same in the room. It's a funny thing to say, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a good feeling. Breathe California means having resources available to us that will help guide us and make our lives easier. Welcome back. This is Breathe California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. I'm the Environmental Health Chair of Breathe California. That's means that, I, that means that I'm a volunteer that's trying to work to stop our lungs from being injured. Uh, most of the money that Breathe California gets is to help people with very serious problems. Last year, we helped 150,000 people with breathing difficulties. Uh, an example is our asthma camp that we run each summer where we put kids with breathing difficulty together so that they can get activities consistent with their physical limitations. So this week we're talking with Fabian Rico, if that sounds familiar. Uh, last month Fabian did a couple of shows for us where he uh, was talking about a specific energy problem. This week I thought uh, we ought to talk about the future of uh, these issues. Uh, so Fabian, welcome back. Hey, how are you doing? So you're not even an environmental studies major. San Jose State does most of its energy issues in environmental studies. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your background. Uh, well, first things first, my major, I'm at San Jose State, I'm a business administration major with an emphasis on marketing, but where, where the energy and environmental stuff comes in is I'm minoring in green building and energy policy as well. So what in the world are green building and energy policy? For a lot of us, you know, when I went to school, those terms didn't exist. So what is it? Okay, well, to put it in, the, in strictly layman terms, uh, green building basically means that you try to find ways to create the most efficient and like cradle to cradle building and and sustainable so when as you well. So cradle to cradle, you're talking about saving as much energy as possible. Is that what that means? Uh, not not just saving as much energy as possible, but also down to the product life cycle. You have a table, and then when you when that table's beyond its use, it just goes in the landfill. But like I mentioned in my previous appearance with waste to energy, you could, you could kind of find ways to further utilize uh, like things that you would see as trash. Uh, I've, I've done research recently on vehicle to grid uh, mixed with a like solar leasing combo. And with vehicle to grid, those EV batteries still remain useful uh, even, even after their automotive life. Like, I've, so let's back off here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're too damn smart. So explain vehicle to grid. I'm going to go buy an electric car. Mm. Explain the connection between vehicle to grid and that. Okay, with vehicle to grid, okay, think of this as your electric car. You buy, you buy your electric car, and uh, the plus side is you don't have to go to the gas station and line up uh, and, like, waiting for cars to move so you can fill up your tank. You can just roll on home and just just plug it in right there. But the thing with vehicle to grid is uh, when, when you're charging your vehicle dur during the peak or non-peak uh, charging times, the grid will actually take back uh, some of that electricity to uh, supplement for the grid during those peak hours. And uh, in, in the paper so that- So your yeah. car battery actually ends up being part of the grid, you could actually lose energy to the grid? Yeah, yeah, you, you could reappropriate your old used EV batteries to contribute back to the grid. Oh, so after your car's done? Yeah, like af after okay. the battery is 
pretty much done its service in, in the automobile life and pretty much retired to a life of leisure of just contributing to the grid. Uh, meaning that you would put it in your garage to store or the auto dismantler would, would use it? Uh, or none of the above? Either of the above, to be honest. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, because storage capacities are a big problem. And if you have solar on your roof and you have your own batteries to store things, you get less dependent on uh, the grid itself. Yeah, and, and I think the importance of vehicle to grid mixed with, uh, the, with a solar leasing combo is that, is that as more households adopt, as more households adopt EVs in general, uh, like society as a whole will start gaining less reliance on the so-called dummy grid and, and build a whole new smarter grid around that. Dummy being what we have now. Yeah, just like power lines everywhere. Like, uh, like if you step outside your house and try to follow the power line, you'll like see this like jumble of just cord just like sticking out, like, like someone just uh, came back from a bed and just like, oh, this works. Okay, I'll attach this here, attach that there, and so on. Yeah. Obviously, you're a student that's going to graduate pretty soon. Mm -hmm. You're saying something about where you think the jobs in the marketplace is going to be with your selections of uh, a major and minor what is that uh yeah i've i've definitely seen the uh connection between green energy and just the environmental movement in general becoming a booming booming industry in the future it was around spring of 2012 when i realized this uh it, it was it was from one of my english teachers actually and she was uh very like passionate about all these environmental issues and told me all these things I didn't know about because but before that class even occurred like I, w I was your typical like apathetic citizen of just all like oh like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be dead like by the time all this stuff kicks in anyway so uh, so I <laughs> might as well just like litter everywhere throw cups on the ground but after I took that class it really kind of shifted my perspective on things uh, like during that class was when I was first exposed to Tesla Motors be before it became Tesla Motors uh, in, in the way it's blown up today, and uh, I, th I think the connection that the connections that remain in my mind at that time is that like it's not just about like efficiency and sustainability because like that might not even be an issue with some people, but there are people that seek like technological advances of just like like this is like when I saw the Tesla, it's like this isn't your like uh, electric vehicle that people would perceive as like the weak kind, like this. This car rips, you know. Yeah, so, and it, it, you know, it's not really part of our program. Mm -hmm. But you know, I had a friend pick me up an electric car, and he says, "You don't realize how quick they can accelerate." And he picked me up at the San Jose airport, and before we got to the um, Julian exit, mm -hmm. he was going 109. Yeah, uh, there wasn't any problem with him accelerating faster. So, an electric car, the that stuff isn't the problem, but. It, you know, in the bigger world, this area is the leader mm -hmm. in terms of innovation, and it's not high tech in the traditional electronic terms or biotech, which has become a big thing, but most people don't realize 85% of the new environmental, green, energy efficient technologies are all being invested in here. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself getting in the front of that parade, that wave of things? Oh, of course. Like, uh, I, I definitely foresee myself in the future to utilize the knowledge that I'm gaining from my minor and just like melding it together with all the business knowledge I'm learning at San Jose State and either launch uh, some, some kind of green energy venture on my own or helping someone else out with it because it, it definitely is rapidly becoming a booming industry. So talk a little bit about your background. Uh, how did you just happen to stagger out of being a typical, most people don't realize San Jose State is dominated by business majors. Mm -hmm. um, how in the world did you move or make this discovery that um, environmental technologies, green technologies, conservation, alternative energy were gonna be this big massive wave that takes over our country and the world. 
Yeah, like, uh, like how, how those thoughts came to be, like, happened right around the same time of uh, spring 2012, because, because as I saw these technologies, like, it, it, it really gave me a feeling of, we're in the future, you know, you, you, like, you got cars that drive like spaceships that go from zero to 100 really quick, and... So that's what you wanted, a fast car? I, oh, no, I, okay, uh, honestly, I wanted a flying car, and, uh, and, and the phrase that I, that, like, went through my mind is, like, I can't envision the, like, consumer-level flying car to be run by coal or fossil fuels, so mm -hmm. the rationale I made in my head is that the closer that we get to a green and clean energy economy, the closer I get to my flying car. So uh, we're talking with Fabian Rico about our future, a future that's going to require us to uh, use alternative energy techniques to conserve energy. And uh, we're going to see a fantastic range of new inventions. Uh, if you don't believe that, just take a look back at where we were 100 years ago, and we're going even faster now. See you in 30 seconds. What it feels like to have an asthma attack is, well, you can't breathe and you can't tell anybody that you're having an asthma attack because you, you can hardly talk. You can maybe say one or two words, but you can't say much else. Breathe California has helped me come in contact with more asthmatics and more people who have the same case as I do. It's important to me because I don't feel like I'm alone in the fight against asthma. Welcome back to Breathe California TV. My name is Terry Trumbull. I teach energy policy at San Jose State. And as luck would have it, one of my all-star students is Fabian Rico. He uh, talked to us last month about waste to energy systems. Today, we're talking about the future. Why does a student go into this field? And he's laid out a lot of good reasons. So, what was your inspiration? Was it that English teacher where startlingly was very green and environmentally conscious? Yeah, like it, it definitely planted the seed as far as like, I could see this as a boom industry, so what's gonna be my role in it? Uh, because un unlike San Jose, uh, unlike the San Jose area, uh, like where I'm from down in SoCal, like it's not, as much emphasis on like these clean energy technologies. When when I first moved up here, I, I'm. But you could be a movie star. Anyhow, so where are you from in Southern California? Uh, I'm from the Los Angeles County. Uh, to to be specific on city wise, I'm originally from West Covina, California. So, West Covina, um, it's typical middle of LA County, and mm -hmm. you just uh, didn't have any exposure to the environmental energy related stuff that we've been talking about no no not really like i i, ha I all i ha had uh, as as far as knowledge of like clean energy and the environmental movement was from what i heard on tv or just from from my peers but i've never really taken the time to like uh really have a more educated look at what climate change is what uh what clean energy is so uh, in your class and some of my other environmental law classes, I say, hey, my generation and those before me have screwed the world up so bad. I guarantee all you people that are going into environmental and energy areas jobs. Does that sound realistic or just plain uh, hyperbole from your old professor? Hmm, uh, could, could you elaborate more on that? Well, just do you s see that this is a really good field to be going into, that there's a lot to be done and, and society is going to demand people to do it. Of course, of course. Like, uh, there was even an article that I read about a month ago that, uh, that talked about the Rockefeller family of, of Jay-Z Rockefeller uh, divesting about like a, a couple billion of their fossil fuel investments and reinvesting that towards more clean energy, so I feel like that really uh, show like says a he heavy statement that like 
it's inevitable. Like it's it's pretty much inevitable that we're going to be moving to this clean energy economy. It's just a matter of like uh, who's going to be resistant to it and how can we alleviate that. So energy policy, what's grabbed you the most? Uh, we haven't spent, frankly, in class that much time talking about green building. Uh, anything in particular that uh, you're more interested in or less interested in? Well, uh, regarding energy policy, the, the most appealing thing about it to me, uh, I remember in class we were doing the mediation exercise. Yeah. And like even, even though it was pretty much a simulation of what happens in real life because real life isn't really that easy <laughs> in reality. Uh, it, it, it really like energized me a bit to, to like hear out all the concerns of all these different factors because uh, with any, any new development, there's going to be people that have their pros and cons, people that will be affected more unequally than others. But, it, but when it comes to energy policy, it just depends on how ready you are to adapt to all that and, and where you could find compromises. Yeah, and I, that's why I give the assignment, but it's nice to get the feedback mm -hmm. because we're not very good at the national level with our two-party system mm -hmm. about figuring out how to work together on things. But your class did get together, even though they were being graded on it, and so there were winners and losers to resolve uh, the particular problems. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that issue just to give a sense for our audience of what environmental mediation is and then maybe use the example. Okay, so how, how the class exercise went is uh, we, we were kind of role playing uh, a scenario where an oil rig was about to open up somewhere in Alaska and we had one group playing the oil company, we had another group being the, the Inuit tribe, the teachers, the educators that, that all want a piece of, uh, of the pie from, from the oil company where it's just like, okay, if you guys are going to open up here, we're cool with it as long as you give us money. So uh, most of the exercise was just um, trying to find ways to accommodate everybody to like at, at least get somewhat of a slice of the pie. Because uh, my, my role in the exercise, I was one of the mediators, and, uh, and I said this to all the groups too, where uh, my only job so is the me. the mediator's job, just even though it's probably obvious, what's, what's the mediator trying to do? make everybody happy. So we got eight different groups and you're trying to find a way to uh, get them to agree on something. Yeah. So tell everybody to give you, because I think it says something about how realistic the assignment is. Mm -hmm. How are you graded? Uh, we're, we're actually graded, well for the mediator group we were graded by, uh, like it, it was pretty much a pass or fail because if we couldn't get everybody to agree to an overall solution, that's no points. But if we get everybody to agree uh, to the solution, we like the assignment was worth five points, but we would get like six points or something yeah. like that. So, so. It, you were the most all or nothing yeah. of the whole thing. So it was just like, I better make everybody happy. Or so I'm not gonna be happy. you were dealing with 32 other real live human beings. Mm -hmm. What kind of things perhaps independent of the group they represented did you see? Different tactics and different things that groups were doing. Okay, uh, well I'm not putting it on the group itself because these were instructions that you wrote for them, but the oil company was kind of shady in the way they were dealing with the, with, uh, the tactics and stuff because uh, there, there's one point in class where we couldn't like find out the cost of a boat. We're asking every group like, hey, what's the cost of a boat? I've been spending like 15 minutes with someone who's in the Inuit group just like, uh, just like, how much does a boat cost? I know you guys have boats. And then it turned out the oil company had the boat price the whole time. I'm just like, man, it should have took more of your money. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it was being graded, each yeah. group had um, advantages on a five point in essence quiz mm -hmm. by keeping their mouth shut uh, and would do poorer if everybody knew what rules they were playing on. But the whole goal of the assignment was to understand all of the other different interests and give you a, at least a hint of one technique for, for working on it. Mm -hmm. um, last time you talked about waste energy, mm -hmm. I headed the state um, solid waste management agency, which was waste energy recycling and landfills. 
And I had a full-time mediator for me, and we were only to get able to get one out of 34 disputes to talk to each other. And that one got cited, and none of the other 33 ever went into business. You know, it really is worthwhile to work together. So other things that you liked about the class? Let's see. There were a lot of things I liked about the class, uh, particularly some of the quiz prompts that you, you asked about regarding uh, nuclear proliferation uh, of, of about like how, okay, uh, Car Carter banned that but seemed to conflict with his platform and then Reagan unbanned it but it still didn't or happen. Then, yeah, it must be fairly startling to come in and realize how our national policies on virtually everything, but particularly on energy and the environment, one party comes in and it just completely goes 100% the other way. And then when those guys, then the other party comes in, it goes the other way. And they just seem to be at each other's throats. I mean, as somebody who's a European or Japanese, it must be positively embarrassing figuring out from year to year who you're going to be working with. Right. So uh, any of this inspire you to go into politics so you can get your thoughts in it? Because you were dealing with policy the way we make our governmental decisions. Uh, I'm not sure if I would ever uh, want to volunteer to be in the political light. Like I've, I've, I, I've, I feel like with, given my background, I've, I feel as if my, my skills could somehow be more well utilized in the private sector of promoting these green energy businesses and just like trying to find unique ways to get like all, all this technology that we have on hand to the consumer level. Well, the, the changes are going to be pretty dramatic. So um, is our gain Southern California's loss? You came here to San Jose State from Southern California. Do you see the same type of opportunities going back south? I, I, like there's definitely opportunities everywhere for the expansion of the environmental industry, uh, and and just because I moved from SoCal, uh, no way implies that I'm not gonna uh, like not go back with like into the sun sunrise and stuff. But uh, I I definitely want to be in in a position where uh, I, I could kind of uh, do NorCal business and SoCal business like. Go, going hand in hand, so if it's something as simple as like, oh, I open a business around NorCal and then I have a Southern California branch, then uh, that could definitely be a possibility. But yeah, I, de I definitely, in so Southern California in particular, I definitely see a lot of opportunity for the renewable energy industry around there because uh, uh, at, at least around my neighborhood, there isn't really much implementation of like solar panels or any any other other of these things, and I feel like the massive adoption of that in both NorCal and SoCal would really provide a precedent and an example for the rest of the country of just like you guys can do it too. Like, like you, you don't even have to believe in global warming to even implement the policy because it's because there there are so many other values that connects uh, that connects with the environmental movement beyond. Uh, beyond climate change. I remember one class you mentioned that uh, an X amount of people were surveyed and asked how much they value clean air and it was like upwards of like 80 something percent uh, and then you followed that up with another uh, statistic saying that of, out of people in the United States that believe in climate change it's, it was like less than 50 or barely 50 something like that and and that that kind of struck a chord with me because like it, it kind of reaffirms my my viewpoint of uh trying to make the environmental movement progress because there are a lot of values such as like oh this is really cool futuristic technology it's going to save me a lot of money and the air is cleaner like you don't even have to mention climate change at all so i feel like uh, if, if we kind of shift that perspective a bit, people will be a lot more open to start adopting these solutions. Well, that would sound exactly what I'd expect out of a marketing major. You're 
uh, a business administration oriented, but marketing, that must have played a big note with you. You're selling the exact same idea, but the way you package it makes a big difference. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, packaging definitely makes a difference because what, what I really enjoy about marketing is it out of the fields of counting finance, like this one uh, em has more emphasis on creativity and really getting to know like the human psyche of it all. Uh, to that, that could be used for either good or bad. So um, I'm on I'm on the good side, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope to God everybody listening to this program is on the good side, meaning that they ought to feel whatever they're doing in life that they're doing something that's making it a, a better place that they enjoy what they're they're doing. Definitely. So do you have some great idea that's going to get you that Tesla? Because right now, um, you know, unless you're robbing banks as a sideline. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have some great idea you're going to pursue yourself to, to well, get there? Uh, currently, there are no, like, ideas that I have, like, written down in a Google Doc somewhere as far as renewable energy goes. Because uh, the thing with creativity, or TV, <laughs> what have mm -hmm. you, is that... Uh, like the idea, is, like I definitely do plan to open my own ventures in the future, but uh, it's mostly based on ideas that happen to come to mind. Of just like, okay, I like that. Let's go with that, and and I, I just go in there hoping that everything will fall into place, which usually does. So uh, we got thirty seconds left. You've chosen this as a career path. Do you see there is a future for other people that are starting school and? Uh, green building, efficiency, environmental protection? Of, of course, like not, not just in the United States, but um, even, even worldwide as well, because the world is becoming a lot more globalized or flat, as, as you would call it, because green building can become a really big industry in the United States, especially in China as and well. And I'm going to apologize, Fabian, but we've got to wrap up oh. here. So we've been talking with Fabian Rico about energy issues. Hope you do what he does. Go to school and start working on it. See you next week. Stay learned. Mm -hmm.